Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you very much for participating this breakout session lessons from aviation. Um, I, my name is uh, Francine, I, I'm Manager of International Affairs at Hamburg Aviation, and I am happy to do the moderation today with, uh, with this uh, wonderful women uh, and speakers here today, as you can see in the screen. Uh, I would like to ask you to, uh, yeah, I, I invite you to ask your questions and uh, or share some comments of uh, that you'd like uh, and post them in the chat during our during our breakout session. And uh, now I would just like uh, to tell everyone enjoy the session and uh, wish you a wonderful time. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction with each of our of our wonderful women here. I'm going to start with Natasha Gagnon. So Natasha um, is an economist with over 15 years of business development and international trade promotion. She discovered a passion for aerospace in her former role as trade officer for the UK government and were previously based at the British Consulate General in Montreal. In her role at Ontario Aerospace Council, she has helped to develop strategic partnership opportunities for the association, as well as launching many new strategic member programs in the areas of research and technology, cybersecurity, pr preparedness, media relations, and digital transformation. So, Natasha, um, I yeah welcome to welcome to this session and um maybe for first question for you uh, how has the supplier development changed uh, with the involvement of aam thank you francine for the introduction um it's very exciting um we are attracting new members because of aam and um we're helping them source capabilities within our aerospace ecosystem and linking them to um, suppliers that are innovating in the space and others that are you know have capabilities in composites battery work uh, electronics it's, it's very exciting work so that's um a focus for us and i i, I really love linking the ecosystem uh, to these new um, AM projects Thank you very much, Natasha. I'd now like to continue with uh, Chelsea Wright. Welcome, Chelsea. And uh, Chelsea has been in aviation for roughly five years already with a specific focus on airport safety and emergency response. She is a director on the senior leadership team for a group called Elevate Aviation in Alberta. Uh, they encourage women and equity seeking groups to start a career in aviation and provide them with support to succeed in their career. She's also a safety specialist for Edmonton International Airport, ensuring passengers, employees, stakeholders and community and safe in all aspects of, this, of business. And uh, yeah, welcome Chelsea. And if I was seeking in a career in aviation, how how exactly would Elevate uh, Aviation support me in that? Uh, thank you again, Francine, for the introduction. So if anyone was seeking a career in aviation, Elevate Aviation has multiple programs that you can consider. Uh, we really like to focus on mentorship. So every age from kindergarten to career, we're mentoring um, students and people and different groups on how they can get into aviation. So we'll find a pathway for you. We will set up a mentorship or a mentor so that you can find if that career is exactly for you. And then we'll put you in a program that can help you advance your career skills. Uh, so if you guys are interested in those, please let me know after the discussion and I can show you those programs. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, ne next person I'd like to introduce is Trisha Gatson from Deloitte. Trisha has always been fascinated and captivated by flying. Her first job in aviation was in 1995. During university, she was a ticket agent and she loved the job so much and was fascinated by the hustle and bustle of the airport operations. So she decided to become a, a, a behavioral investigator specializing in aviation. 
fast forward 20 years and the break from aviation, she's, she's back to aviation at Deloitte where she gets to work alongside aviation clients from all facets of the industry and tackles their toughest business challenges. These days she geeks, um, she geeks out with digital twin modeling analysis of the airspace. So welcome Trisha and uh, you, you took a break from aviation, right? What made you come back to the industry? Oh, great question. In so many ways, I feel like I never left because when I wasn't you know, getting paid to do what I love, I was learning to fly and jumping out of airplanes. I'd say though, professionally, it was the opportunity from a consulting perspective to work with many different businesses in the ecosystem. And I think because I love a, a challenge and tackling problems, it really allowed me to, to dive into that. And so here I am. <laughs> Couldn't <great>. stay away. <laughs> I, an, AV, an airhead and a geek at heart, right? <laughs> That's right. Perfect. So we are happy to have you here today. And then I'd like to introduce uh, Yolanka Wolf from the CAMI, um, the Community Air Mobility Initiative, where you are the ex executive um, director of. And Yolanka started in this nonprofit initiative almost two years ago with the mission to support the responsible integration of the third dimension into our daily transportation needs. CAMI works with state, provincial, tribal, and local decision makers and leaders to educate, communicate, and collaborate on advanced air mobility, bridging the industry with the communities where advanced air mobility will be implemented. By profession and education, Yolanka is a nonprofit attorney and consultant, and she stumbled onto the world of electric aviation 11 years ago through a client and has been here ever since. Welcome, Yolanka. Thank you, Francine. <laughs> and I would just like to jump into our topic of lessons of aviation today. And uh, may I ask you, uh, Yolanka, could you please explain uh, what, what's, the, um, what's the integration um, of the third dimension? What, what does it mean exactly? Um, and what are the challenges of the in integration of, air, uh, of advanced air mobility um, uh, compared to aviation? Well, great question, and I could talk for hours on that, but I'll, I'll try to be concise. Um, so the unique aspect of advanced air mobility is, is this ability to bring, um, trans, to, to bring this third dimension to our transportation needs. And it's unique in the world of aviation because aviation as a form of transportation until now has really been isolated from other forms of transportation. And those of us in aviation tend to think with our aviation hats on. But when we talk about bringing um, these new vehicles into, um, into the urban core, into metropolitan regions, um, even into, into more rural applications, we're really adding a new mode to multimodal transportation systems. And, that, and that's a place that aviation has not gone yet. Aviation hasn't needed to, to coordinate its locations, its times, its routes to be part of an integrated transportation system. So for, for example, you can imagine that um, somebody living in a suburb might take a light rail station from their, their suburb or their um, small town outside of the urban core into a, a, a mobility hub, a multimodal hub near the outside of an urban core. And from there take uh, an EV to electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft from the top of that multimodal mobility hub to fly into the city um, mm -hmm. and, um, rather than everybody driving single occupancy vehicles. So um, that requires some integration. It, re it, it means that we need to think of mobility hubs with this ability to add a third dimension to our transportation systems. 
Um, and, and so I think, you know, one, uh, there are a lot of challenges to that. There are a lot of opportunities as well. Um, when we, when we start to add that third dimension where we're able to span, uh, topographical, geographical, um, uh, uh, challenges like bodies of water, mountains that really allows us to connect people with, or, you know, the opportunities, jobs, services, education, medical um, that larger urban centers provide without having to drive for hours and hours, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, thank you very much. And um, uh, how, if if we want to integrate uh, the the pub the public and the this uh, citizens, um, how do you do that? How uh, what can we do to get them involved? Great question, and that's that's what we do at Cami. So um, uh, one of the one of the things that we need to think about is that we have this great opportunity with this convergence of technologies, electric propulsion, autonomy, data networks. Um, but but that but it's what it, we need to do now is understand from the local perspective what are the opportunities that we can um, that we can look at given that this technology is here and that means really working with each community to understand what are their challenges what are their needs in terms of transportation and what what might be valuable for. For instance, I, uh, my community, I live in the Seattle, Washington area, might be very different from Los Angeles or Toronto or Hamburg. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it's about understanding what those needs are. And that, that starts with education, it starts with understanding what advanced air mobility is, what, it, what the opportunities are, but also what are some of the challenges. Um, what we don't want to do is create um, create a system, for instance, that is expensive, so it's only accessible to the very wealthy. We want to make sure that it's designed from the start to be accessible to people of all abilities. Um, we want to make sure it integrates well with public transportation and doesn't take funds and riders away from public transportation. So it's really an urban or metropolitan regional planning exercise, a transportation exercise, and, and it's leading with diversity and equity to understand how we design a system that serves everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I'd like to ask a question to, to um, Natasha. Um, in, in aviation, uh, we, and we have also heard that from Yulanka, we're really focused on, on customers and um, how, what do you think, uh, how can advanced air mobility benefit from, from what we have learned from the aviations, like with the focus on, on customers? We cannot hear you at the moment. So sorry. Um, I think there's going to be a huge shift. Uh, so yes, um, in aerospace and aviation, the focus is on the client. Our AR lines, you know, for our Boeing and, and Airbus, it's is key of building aircrafts that meet their criteria and their needs. Um, and now with AM, uh, there's an opportunity to kind of understand what a different audience needs. So the general public, right? and um, creating that user experience and that customer focus so that um, the public falls in love with a possibility and can access it through an app and can you know, purchase a ticket easily. So after jumping on the subway can come up and potentially get into an advanced air mobility aircraft to get to um, her or his final destination. So, I think for developers of this new technology and these new aircrafts, it's going to be very important to get to know the new clients um, in this in this new um, industry. Absolutely, maybe uh, Chelsea or Trisha, do you have any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Trisha. Oh, I was <laughs> going to say you can go ahead. <laughs> um, lots of thoughts of. of uh, and, and one of which I would say culturally differences, say, between Europe and, and Canada, how uh, the public 
chooses to move it are quite different. We, we tend to hop in our cars in Southern Ontario and drive everywhere. When I lived in the UK, I maybe touched a car once in four months because it was, it was train or tube. And so I think that um, as far as research goes and understanding those needs, um, absolutely. The other thing is the notion of customer. Is it business? Is it public? The one thing that unites is the opportunity to basically be zero emissions and really mm -hmm. tap into that sustainability. And so I think that there's a big opportunity from day one as this infrastructure and the network and all the planning is being done. Like how can this industry be zero emissions from day one? So it's like the art of the possible is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just touch on that to say like, I'll, our past and the whole industry behind it has kind of been a taboo topic, I'd say in the last 10 years when it comes to aviation and airspace and even to the general public. And we're really trying to change that narrative as this is the next big thing that's coming up. This is gonna be that third dimension of transportation. How can we make it so appealing to people that that's the industry that they wanna jump into right out of high school or you know, that's gonna be their preferred mode of transportation. So I think changing the narrative by positive communication, community outreach, um, going out to schools and to universities, and you know, just promoting this this uh, this, this diversity um, of a of a career, I think would be so important, and I think it would really help us jumpstart. Hmm. Maybe and we, we touched before. Yeah. Sorry, is maybe less acronyms as well. So a lesson to <laughs> learn from maybe aviation we have to maybe stop or lessen the acronym so now right now we have eVTOL, our pass um uam um drones you know there's there's so many acronyms and maybe we have to simplify the messaging as well and make it more user friendly absolutely i agree with you and so for any further uh, explanations in this in this uh, breakout session we, we should make sure to explain all all those acronyms then um, and as you as you were just uh, speaking about, um, yeah, uh, the the promotion of of um, of this new technology, um, I, I have the feeling if if you once um, work in the aviation industry, you are really passionate about it, and you you just love what you do, and you will, you um, normally never want to go somewhere else. Uh, do you think this is possible for advanced air mobility as as well? Yeah, I would think so for sure. It all corresponds with aviation. Uh, I know myself coming from the energy industry in Alberta, coming into aviation, it was a big eye opener to me and I'll never leave aviation. I know I'm going to continue in this career. And I think the knowledge just isn't there for students, whether that's um, grade seven to 12 or university that these careers are even available. And once they find that this these careers are available, I feel like they're going to jump right into it and it's going to be so technology advanced and so successful that they'll probably never want to leave advanced air mobility. Mm. And, and we were talking earlier about the fact that there's so many lessons from aviation, but also from other industries, be it mining or energy. And we even talked about um, like even there's a first class, a business class and an economy class. Well, there's the opportunity just to blow that out and it's mm -hmm. travelers. And so it, it becomes less about um, in individual classes and more about what's the inclusion play. It's a hot topic these days, but it, it's absolutely relevant. And as an industry, there's an opportunity to have one vision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, one point that we uh, should, yeah, clearly learn from from the aviation i guess is is the topic of safety right um so what what can we do to to really learn uh and to continue the safety standards for advanced air mobility as it is in in aviation already i'll, I'll speak to that um or at least start off the conversation i'm sure we all have something we'd <laughs> like to say about that so um you know uh, legacy commercial aviation has has a really strong safety record, and I think that the mm -hmm. advanced air mobility industry recognizes that it 
um, it also needs to um, meet those safety records um, because when not only are we transporting people in the air, but we're now transporting people over much more populated areas. And so there's an even greater um, issue with safety for people on the ground um, and people at the vertiports. So um, um, the, other, the other interesting challenge with advanced air mobility is that when you look at the possibilities and the vision, th this, is, this is a form of travel that will have far greater volumes than current commercial uh, aviation does. It's going to be more like automobiles. And even at the same safety levels that we have now, when, if you multiply that out by a, a far greater volume, it means that we're going to have more frequent incidents. And, and I think that the industry recognizes that. And so there, there's an opportunity to think um, creatively about how do, we, how do we make this whole system um, safe enough that um, that it will be accepted not just by the passengers who will travel, but also by the communities in which it will um, be implemented, the people on the ground, the local decision makers that will need to uh, approve this and work with their communities to integrate it. So um, I know that there, you know, the, our other speakers have some comments about some of that technology, but it's, um, it's, it's an opportunity to, to look at safety in yet, uh, at yet another level. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yolanka. Um, so uh, Natisha, Natasha, what are your thoughts on, on the point of safety? Um, I think our regulations and our standards are uh, very strict in aviation and aerospace. And um, uh, to Yolanka's point, we can go even better. I think it's very exciting because we have um, these standards, we, we kind of have a, like a benchmark where to work from and mm -hmm. do better. Um, and there's exciting technology that's being developed to actually um, help the public feel more safe. So with autonomous vehicles, so maybe, you know, the illusion of the Jetsons, and it makes me laugh when people bring that up, but the highways in the sky, that is possible today. And it's energy fields that we can use. And that way we can see that some of these aircrafts will be in specific areas only. And then hopefully, you know, um, with each new application, the public will understand that we're looking at how to um, keep their community safe and how this will not, you know, infringe on their personal rights. And that this is this this is a, a positive thing and how it's going to impact not only transportation but delivery um, health care and everything so um, I, I think it's we can do better um, and we will do better thanks to all these new technologies that are coming out mm -hmm. very good point thank you I'd just like to add Francine as well mm -hmm. um, we go all the way back to just the basic communication skills. So when you're developing uh, like these highways in the skies, like Natasha is talking about, or having drones come into uh, secured airspace, such as an airport, going back to our communication skills and making sure that com we're communicating with the jurisdictions around us, whether that's the counties or the cities or uh, the emergency services so that we're all on the same page. Everyone's taking the exact same training. Everyone's being taught the exact same thing that there's, so there is no room for mistakes. And that's when it boils down to a safety is communication and training. So if we start off this industry with exceptional training, which we already have, strict mm -hmm. regulations, which we already have, um, and extreme communication, I think there'll be no issues. Um, and this will be a lot safer than the other two modes of transportation, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, and Trish. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Got, I gotta love the delay sometimes. <laughs> um, we would all agree that aviation is really the, the role model when it comes to safety. And pilots practice, practice, and practice again. And it is really because their paycheck comes for one the one time they're needed to respond to an emergency situation. 
And I think that in, in this particular case, um, we, we do have an opportunity to document the mistakes, carve out the lessons learned, and then bring out new, new um, standards for safety. And the, the thing here too is, is that um, if one element in the ecosystem is disruptive, it puts the entire network at risk. And, I, and what I like that's happening in advanced air mobility is the collaboration and almost the co-optition of it, where each individual is coming together and looking at it from an ecosystem perspective. Because when um, we layer in behavior and how people might react in an emergency situation and how that differs, mm -hmm. um, then that's when things go, go haywire. And I... I mean, when, when you introduced um, me, you talked about me geeking out on digital twin simulation. And what I love about our opportunity here is we can model all of this before we go into a live situation. And, and I think that aviation didn't have that in the same way. And so lessons learned were far more retroactive from an investigation perspective. That can mm. load in and put us at a different starting point. And, and mm. that's the real gift I, I think mm -hmm. and um, w when you were speaking about um, digital twin um, would it be an opportunity to fasten the um, certification for uh, for for safety safety because this is something that I uh, think is uh, in aviation um, yeah a, a challenge uh, because all those certifications of, of all technology it takes years to come and that's a um, that's a challenge so would it would it help the uh, digital digital twins and technologies well let's let, just take a moment when we think about digital twin and ultimately it's a simulation and it's a yeah. replica of a real life environment and depending on the maturity of the digital twin where you can put in filters or take them away for example, air separation or weather, and what if scenarios to um, change decisions in the airspace in the moment. And I think that um, when it comes to comes to that, it, it's a great tool for understanding the what ifs. And it will be probably an, a different type of um, evaluation that would need to happen if we, we were to go that route. And I just saw it popping up in, in the group trap, um, the question around how do you think the general population will react and, and what is the level of trust? And, and, I, and I do think publication of research and showcasing does a long way to help plant those seeds of, of trust and simulation mm -hmm. is a way to do that. I'd, I'd love to mm -hmm. be like Chelsea, Natasha, Yolanda, like trust is huge everybody in the ecosystem has got to collaborate together to get the public. It's a bit far-fetched because they can't visualize it. Yeah. When, when roads were being built in the 1900s, everyone could see the grid going down. It's very exciting. You can't see a drone highway go in. You can't mm -hmm. visualize it. How do you trust what you can't see? Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thank you. I think that I think that's really true, Tricia. And I think um, I'm just looking at the question in the in the chat about autonomy. I th I think that um, it's it's going to be an interesting um, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch this this industry develop. I um, you know at some level um, I think that to it you know for the industry to scale up and to maintain these safety levels, we have to have autonomy at some level. Um, and, and autonomy occurs, of course, on a spectrum. Um, and I think that some of that trust will come with um, starting small, starting with demonstration projects and phasing into large, you know, larger scale operations, as well as phasing into um, uh, autonomy 
that's not to say that there aren't some companies that are starting off with autonomy, which is which is great. But I but in terms of the the customers' view of this, um, or the or or the public's view of this industry, I think we will see um, a lot of aircraft that start off piloted and then move towards autonomy. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to grow trust over time, but um, it's really key to have um, early demonstrations um, so that, um, and, and especially demonstrations of use cases that the public can relate to. So for instance, emergency services, medical transportation, the, we can, we can understand why those are important. Even if we're not the one writing it today, we know that it's there if something happens to us. Um, if our first experience as a, you know, as the public with these aircraft are for the very wealthy to fly from their estate to their downtown office, we have a, a lot harder challenge in terms of developing community acceptance. So I think uh, safety is a big piece of that, but it, there's also trust that we're building a system that will have broad public benefit. Mm -hmm. If I could hop in. Yes, yeah, sure. B back in the day, elevators were operated by a human. And remember, I, I don't, but I remember my mom telling me stories. She would never get in an elevator without an elevator operator. <laughs> and now if a human is in an elevator, we wonder what's wrong. And so that same evolution will start to happen as we go from two pilots to one pilot to no pilot. Like it, it's gonna be part of our human nature not to trust, but it's yeah. also our job to bring people along the journey. So they then get in an elevator without an operator and don't even think about it. And, and a question from the chat is how does this work for pilots is simply love to fly. From, I don't, I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think that um, moving to autonomy for commercial operations precludes pilots who want to fly from flying. Um, mm -hmm. There may be some adjustment in, um, in terms of airspace management with more vehicles, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think it prevents anybody from flying who wants to, who wants to pilot their plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is in addition to, it's not replace. I think. Yeah. And there will be, or will there be um, a more special uh, job opportunities in the, uh, in the AAM um, sector than in the future? What do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. You can, you can use AAM for any kind of industry in the world. Um, I'll, I'll use Africa as an example. I know in South Africa and Mozambique, there's a company called Air Shepherd, and they are actually using AAM to um, get rid of poachers for large African animals for the top five. So they're coming in using these technologies to make sure that the animal is extinction rate isn't going down because of poachers. So there's something like that extreme, or you could come back into Canada and you can, I know here at Edmonton airports, we're using um, AAM potentially to have our package picked up at the Amazon warehouse and then flown over to the house in Leduc and then over to the cargo jets. Like there's all different things we can we can think about, but I think it'll be applicable to every single industry. So no matter what specialty you have, you'll have access to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to read out another question from the chat. Uh, do you think that the implementation of self-driving cars, et cetera, will help build the trust within the general public on the, on the build, build up to air highways? <clears throat> Maybe Natasha, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, that's, that's a very tough question. Um, I think personally, no, um, I don't think it will um, impact the way um, people think of um, uncraft, uh, unmanned uh, aircraft at all. I don't think they'll make that connection uh, automatically. And actually, I actually what's happening with self-driving cars right now doesn't wouldn't help. <laughs> I think build that trust. 
Um, I that's all I want to say on that. Yeah, sure, of course. So, uh, then uh, I'll make a comment on that. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think there's, um, I, I agree that, um, well, while from a, from a um, general perspective, there may be some equating of self-driving cars to autonomous aircraft, I, th I think it's a false um, equating. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think there are two reasons. Um, one is that um, the owners of self-driving cars are not commercial uh, transporters, they're, they're private owners. And the second is that self-driving cars have been moving towards autonomy in phases. And I think what we're seeing is that the safety challenges come as you're in those middle phases where there's still a need for a driver to take the wheel at a certain point um, if, there, if there isn't a, a challenge. Um, that I think that's where you have your most dangerous situations, um, where you have a driver who, you know, for 90% of the trip can be texting or sleeping or reading, but now suddenly something, the car can't handle something. I think that we will not see that with advanced air mobility because this is a commercial, uh, a commercial operation. Um, aviation already um, does a good job of managing airspace in a way that we don't manage hi uh, highway space. So I, I, think, I think there are important differences. Um, however, going back to some of our initial uh, comments, communication is critical because there, there is a tendency to say, well, look what's happening with self-driving cars as we move towards autonomy, how can that be safe in aircraft? Um, that doesn't mean we don't need to get it right with aircraft, but it's but it's not the it's not the same. Mm -hmm. and, and maintaining separation as a buffer for safety isn't a new thing. This is a lesson from aviation. And so, if we imagine a hockey puck around an airplane in an air traffic controller, making sure that that separation exists as the aircraft flies through its airspace. That's a very, it's very much a mix of a human making a decision around what air separation requirements need to be met in the moment, but then also the technology that actually measures the exact position of the aircraft. It's a combination of the two. There are technology servicing now that actually built in and um, it, it ha happens automatically. And so I would say then that um, it can be simple and, self-driving cars and the driver's trust of autopilot, which is like a huge topic. You think of how many incidents happen in the, in the air when pilots fighting with their autopilot and back and forth. And that's something that probably needs to have a lot more research into in, in mm -hmm. basically what are all of those use cases and what if factors. And because um, people are going to react very differently and different types of personalities are going to react very differently in different situations. And so how do you normalize that or at least have a good sense of what are the reactions going to be? So technology can help keep that separation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And to, um, I'd like to switch uh, to a completely different uh, a topic now for, for the um, last minutes of our breakout session. Uh, since uh, this is a women in advanced air mobility breakout session, uh, I uh, would like to ask you um, in your experience, uh, and we had a, a little conversation about that earlier, um, women in aviation are quite rare. How do we ensure that the diversity is, um, is, is, is better than it is uh, now in advanced air mobility? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start with that. Um, it all comes down to the company's hiring, your, right, with your, your policies and your procedures and how are you making your environment more inclusive and more diverse? Are you just saying you are doing it to get the the checkbox, or are you actually putting in effort to make sure that you're hiring different uh, genders and ethnicities and whatever it may be to make your industry the most inclusive? 
Um, I think that there's lots of organizations out there that want to start to do this, but they don't even know where to start. Uh, it requires a lot of research, a lot of information. Are we doing it correctly? Um, should we be doing it quicker? Should we take time? All those things are taking into consideration. But uh, if you go back to the schools or the universities and you and you talk to girls then that, that say, well, do you know about this position in aviation? They've never even heard of it. It's never even crossed their mind. So if we aren't even promoting the industry as a whole, how do children know that that's an even an option for them? Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing at, at Elevate Aviation. We're starting with the schools at that kindergarten level and then all the way to career to make sure that those opportunities and the knowledge is even there so people can make their decisions. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, you said something uh, before, uh, it's all about communication and training. I think this is another area where it's all about communication, telling the story, telling, you know, why we all, we all mentioned that we had a love for aviation in some different shape or form um, and sharing those stories, um, but training. Um, so us at the OAC, we have launched a soft skill training program called COAST. Uh, which is supported by the Ontario government. And I would say it is all about diversity and inclusion training. So different areas on that. So please um, reach out to, to us at the OAC if you would like more information. We are very lucky in the other panels, we actually have some of our trainers uh, participating and the lead project um, manager for, for that program participating. We have wonderful resources. So once again, it's about training, training, training. So we do have to get all of our companies to understand what it, it means to be diverse and inclusive. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yolanka, do you have any additional thoughts? Well, I, I agree with what both Chelsea and Natasha have said. I, um, the, and this, this really is a, uh, a question of communication and starting, um, starting young, mm -hmm. starting with young, um, with young girls, um, uh, young people of all genders to, um, to see this industry as something that they can be a part of. Um, so I, it, it comes with education. It also comes with the design of the industry. So if, um, if every aircraft that, or photo of an aircraft that people see is, you know, a white businessman getting into the aircraft with their briefcase, then it becomes, you know, a, a that that's the that's the association you have. Um, mm -hmm. But when you design um, when you design air, the aircraft, when you design the vertiports, when you design the system to accommodate all kinds of needs, um, whether it's a uh, a child uh, car seat uh, or it's um, or it's a wheelchair, then different people can see themselves using that system. So I think, um, again, those are all forms of communication, but they, al they also have to be driven by the companies in the industry um, to lean into all of those different uh, populations and use cases to make, to make this um, available for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Trisha, would you like to add something? I would say when diversity and inclusion first became a hot topic, more than getting women involved in things in general, that my, my aha moment was, I was always raised, treat other people how you want to be treated. But the shift mm -hmm. to be diverse and inclusive of treating people how they want to be treated was a fundamental one inside of me. Because I then started to be curious about asking those questions of like, what are your needs? What do you want? How, how, how do you grow? How do you get interested? And so I think that as far as advanced air mobility goes, or just actually in any industry, um, it's about recognizing an interest in helping somebody harness that to get involved. And, and I do agree that it starts at a younger age, uh, for sure. And I think we're all very passionate about the skies and that if that's an innate thing or a learned thing who cares it's it's really about giving somebody the option and I think that especially because I had some time off from aviation 
it's also the diversity of thought and mm -hmm. um, what somebody can bring to the table as far as challenging a different orthodoxies or just ditching those unconscious biases that we all have. And I think that as a way to um, harness somebody's knowledge or desire to contribute, there's no shortage of opportunities. So it really becomes about coaching and mentoring and helping somebody find their niche. And also even ourselves, because our needs and wants change too over time. We fall in love with different things and we, we're, we need the help too. So I think that um, th that spirit is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what's the kind of spirit that that you would wish for for the future of advanced air mobility? Ooh, it's almost like <laughs> what's our what's our version of putting a man on the moon, which was NASA's. <laughs> I think we need to figure it out. <laughs> Endless. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think you that's know? part of. I I think that's part of what the industry is figuring out as as we go. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what everyone yeah. else thinks. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Okay. <laughs> no, no problem about that. So, um, yeah. So, if you if you think of the of the future of uh, advanced air mobility, uh, what uh, what's your um, uh, what's your what what do you wish for for the for the next uh, five to ten years? What what does your um, future future expectation and um, yeah vision? Where where are we in five to ten years in advanced air mobility? I would like to say that I would love to see more women entrepreneurs in the space whether it's creating aircrafts, user case, test cases, you know, everything around it. I think it's an, an opportunity for women to showcase um, their vision and their innovation. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I would love to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Natasha. Chelsea, would I, you like to continue? Uh, or Trisha, <laughs> just jumped in. No, no, Chelsea, I can't, sorry, I've got some, yeah, go Chelsea. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but having advanced air mobility, not a taboo topic, having it a regular piece of conversation, uh, whether that's with airlines or airports or community or emergency service, whatever it may be. I think once we, you know, are able to talk about it freely and the terminology is understood, I think it'll make us transition so much quicker. Five to 10 years is a huge range. I, I range, I would say in the next two to three years, um, I would love to see it part of a regular transportation and part of that commercial aspect. Um, I think we are already on the way to that. So within two to three years, I think we'll be where we need to be for that really good starting point. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Chelsea. Any further topics, Yulanka? Uh, well, in, in terms of looking at the next five years, I think my my wish is uh, for this industry is that we um, we work collaboratively to find those opportunities to showcase the the true benefits that this technology can bring to communities. And whether that's uh, medical services or connecting remote communities um, or um, augmenting existing public transportation systems. Um, so uh, whatever that looks like, we see, um, we see those really strong examples of, uh, of public benefit uh, lead the rollout of this industry. Thank you so much. And uh, Trisha, do you have a thought on that as well, as well? I would like to see every country with two or three flight paths set up and operating. I think that the industry needs to think through the infrastructure. I mean, there was comments mm -hmm. earlier about lithium batteries, like there's a lot to be worked through. I think that if you start small and you pick a pick a route and take mm -hmm. her for a test drive, I mean, at some point we've got to move from theory and chatting and collaborating, figure out what's needed and actually build it. And you do see that happening, but I want to see more of it. 
Hmm. Great. Let's Thank build. You. We're ready to build. <laughs> We're ready. That's a very good. Uh, a very good uh, thought to 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 close this breakout session. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's uh, now time to uh, to jump back into the post event party. Uh, that I guess everybody has a yeah yeah the the Nishan just posted in the chat the the next room to go to. So I would like to thank all of you for participating in this breakout session. A uh, big thanks to our wonderful speakers here today, Trisha, Yulanka, Natasha, and Chelsea. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. And um, I'd like to let all participants know that the other breakout sessions uh, have been recorded as well. So if you would like to, uh, uh, to watch those, feel free to do so. Um, you will uh, receive an email and information about that from, from the Canadian Advance and Mobility. And, um, Check out the link, the, the further LinkedIn posts uh, regarding future events. Uh, there will uh, there will be uh, some follow up events uh, in in the future, and also uh, in August there's going to be an uh, LGBTQ plus event. Uh, so this is also going to be very exciting. Um, thanks again. It was my pleasure, and I look forward to the party in a minute.